this. Um, I apologize a little bit for the slides. I didn't reformat these from our previous ones. So like we right. um, I was trying to use the projector, but that caused issues. So we'll just we'll, uh, muddle through here. Um, so today we're going to continue on our general parallel stuff with um, MPI. Um, you went through the last two lectures with Ramsey's doing OpenMP, which is a local threading parallel way. This is uh, MPI is a little bit different in that it's it's primarily targeted for distributed memory computing. So this is nodes that are this allows you to do parallel on um, sort of a more general framework. So you can take any nodes, whether if the processors are on the same computer or if they're on completely different um, computers. So this one where MPI really excels and where it's really meant for is scaling to very, very large numbers. So you want to use the whole system or anything off one node. Um, however, it's a little more involved because of that. Um, it's task-based, it's not thread-based, so you're going to do much larger chunks of your data. And it's r fundamentally just a, communi a communication library. Uh, it's not part of the, um, the ecosystem of the language you're compiling, it's not part of the compile at all. It's a message passing interface library. It's really just a communication library. So most of what it involves is just synchronizing a bunch of individual t parts of your code and sending information back and forth. That's, that's all it really is. And the actual MPI construct itself, people get a little bit hung up on it, is actually quite simple. They're just a bunch of function calls to send, you know, put some data, send some data, synchronize some data. But a lot of the trick with MPI is not so much in doing the MPI, it's thinking about how you're going to implement it. That's most of the tricky part. The actual calls and functions themselves are pretty much six calls, a bunch of cut and paste, find an example. But actually organizing your data and figuring out the ecosystem around that, that's where most of this comes from. Whereas with OpenMPI or OpenMP, you're really just looking at you know, here's a loop and I want to parallelize it and I just put a construct and it kind of does a lot of the work for me. This is going to require a little more work uh, on your part to restructure or rethink about your code. Okay? So we're going to go, I'm going to quickly introduce the MPI library and then the ecosystem around MPI. The nice thing about OpenMP is you just set the number of threads and run your code and otherwise it works serially. There's a little more work that has to be done with the MPI code because you could be running it locally. You could be running it on a thousand nodes and you have to be able to tell it some of that information. And so there's the ecosystem around that. And also when you compile it, it's, it, it's a library. So just like when you link in the BLAS and LAPAC and GSL and those other ones, there's some hooks in you have to do. Luckily there's some helpers for that and we'll talk about that. We're going to go through the basics of MPI and a couple of the main pieces, the send receives and some collective operations. I may not get through all these slides today, so I'll see how far I, I make it. And uh, I've got some example codes too, because this is the, really the best way to dig through this stuff. Um, I'm going to have to go through this pretty quick because I only have this in the next lecture to kind of give you the arc of it. So you will, so I apologize in advance, we may skim over some of the stuff that, even though it is important, um, there is a lot of material to cover here, okay? So as I said, MPI has been around for since about the early 90s. Before that, when clusters kind of came out, there's a couple of different constructs people added, PVM, uh, high performance Fortran, and they're all sort of cobbled together. The MPI standard kind of came as a way of a way we want to standardize across languages, make a library that will be universal. And it has become basically that stack. Came out in, in version 1, 94, there's some changes to it. Version 2, they added things like MPIO, so you can do parallel I.O., that was a big change. And then recently they added some stuff in 3 that we're not going to talk about because they're very advanced features. Most of what we need, we're in the first step. It's, it's the main bulk. There's a lot to MPI, but like 300 and some calls, but most of the sort of a handful is all you really need. And a lot of them are just duplications. Um, when most people think of MPI, they think of either OpenMPI or MPitch or one of these. These are the implementations. MPI itself is a standard. It's just kind of like the C++ standard. Then you go and pick a, a compiler. Same sort of idea. So there's a standard implementation. So if you use the MPI standard, it doesn't matter if you're on a Windows machine, you're on a Linux box, you're on a, a, a Power or x86, it doesn't matter. You can use um, different implementations and they'll all work. So there's two main ones, OpenMPI. Um, this is sort of the open source one. This is what you get on your standard Linux box when you install it. Um, and this is available by losing the open MPI. Um, there's a couple different versions of these, um, uh, but this, they both work fine. There's up to, I think they're up to 2.x now. 
Uh, MPitch 2 is the other branch. This is the one, if you use any commercial ones, Intel MPI, uh, SGI MPI, IBM's PoE, they're all based on MPitch. And this comes out of Argonne National Labs. Also free, you can download it. They're perfectly fine. They're from most of the point of view, they're perfect. They're basically the same. They do under the hood. They do things slightly differently, but as far as your codes compiled, there's no change you have to do from one to the other. Um, they're both now fully compliant, and they both have GPU support and some other stuff too. So, so those are the two flavors you'll see in our system. Our version of MPitch is the Intel MPI, which is just Intel's you know rebadging of the same sort of stuff. But it really is a matter of just like going between GCC and ICC. It's just it, it, you shouldn't have any major issues between the two of them. Those are just sort of the implementations. Okay, so MPI is, that is a library. That's the first thing to think. It is not a language construct. Okay, it's not a pragma. It's not a language. It's a library, like calling you know uh, DGEM or something in BLAS. So everything is going to be, and everything is quickly quite simple in it. It is primarily a C and Fortran. Construct. They used to have C++ bindings, but now they've gotten rid of that, so it's primarily um, uh, C. And what it is is just a bunch of fu function calls. Uh, it's not built with a compiler, they're just function calls. So if we look at the C example over here, it doesn't show up too bad actually on here. Um, you'll see this MPI init, there's a com, com rank, and then a finalize. We'll talk about each of those individual pieces, but you're always going to see those four in any MPI code. And if it's in Fortran, it's the same thing, just with more capitals, because everybody in Fortran likes DL. Um, uh, so we have com rank, but they're just function calls, right? So it's almost exactly the same. The only difference is, you know, to Fortran compatibility, they can't pass functions, so the, the error return call is pushed back through here. These can get a little unwieldy. Don't worry about it. Just That's what Google's for. <laughs> Don't worry about the syntax. If you type in MPI underscore init, uh, you'll get the full syntax on the MPitch website and you cut and paste it because some of these, because they are function calls, can get quite long with lots of arguments. Who cares? That's, that's a syntax thing. You can, you, can, you can find that. But they are just simple function calls. Okay? Uh, and then there's, so you just link to the library and there are wrappers to help you compile it. So you don't have to remember all those ugly, unwieldy flags and they're different for different versions and, and all this type of stuff. So you just basically replace your ICC compiler with MPICC, and it'll handle all the hooking and linking and libraries and all that stuff for you. And you don't really have to do this, but it's highly recommended, and it makes it more portable in your make files and stuff. Okay? Oh, yeah, and there, uh, everything gets, because it's a library, you have to include uh, one of the header files. But just think of it as a library, a bunch of function calls, as I said. That part is pretty straightforward to anybody who's worked with libraries. Once again, knowing which pieces to use where is more important than the actual syntax. Okay, so it's a library for message passing. So that's the whole function out of it. It's actually not a parallel library by, just by default. It's a library to allow you to program in parallel. <laughs> it doesn't have anything construct like a for all or any of that type of thing in it. It is a way for you to organize your code so that you can take, you know, start with two, two, two of your serial codes and synchronize them so that you can do work in parallel, right? So it allows you to take two separate functions, I mean, two separate um, binaries, or the same binary, but two different tasks. Um, unlike, unlike in OpenMP uh, MP when you launch the same, you launch the original program, and then it would thread, but you would always start from the same fork. This one actually literally launches two copies. So when you go into top, you'll see my code and my code. You'll see them both running if you launched them with two, two tasks. And what MPI does is it keeps them in check and allows them to talk back and forth. So if they're on the same machine, they'll talk through shared memory. If they're on two different nodes, they'll talk through the network. And under the hood of MPI, you don't have to worry about it, it has some intelligence to know what's on the same node, and if you're on a high-speed network like the GPC, it'll, work, it'll, it'll make those communications properly. But fundamentally, it's just a way of organizing and sending information back and forth. And as we've talked about before, with with communication, you want to you always want to minimize it. So really, the, the trick with MPI is to use as little as much as possible. You want most of your code just doing your work, not running MPI stuff. So you have to you have to put in communications to synchronize your information when you need to, like a piece of data you need on on both. But you don't you want to have as little as possible. So it's think minimalist. It's, it's it'll it's the better for performance and also for programming. Okay. Um, yeah, and so it's really just a, the, the messages are just a series of function calls. 
Um, there's three types of sort of library calls you can kind of think of. Um, there's pairwise communication. Those, that's the sort of most one most people think of. That's, okay, you send a piece of data, I collect it. I send a piece of data, you receive it. So that's what they call pairwise. Everything in MPI is a collect and receive. So if, this, if one guy's sending it, another guy has to receive it. Okay? Um, there is something called one-sided, but we're not going to get into it. As far as you're concerned, you always have to actively send a message and somebody has to receive it. I can't just be on processor zero and throw out a piece of data and expect you got you to pick it up. You have to know where they are in the code and, and, and organize that. And we'll talk about that in more detail. Uh, collective operations are ones that we're all involved with. So we have all of you guys and we're all collecting a piece of data. I could say, let's do a global sum. And you guys all send a piece of data, then I'm processor zero and I, I, I sum it all together and do and send it all back or collect it. So that's a collective operation, not just a zero and one or one and three or anything like that, back and forth. Those are collective operations. And those are a way of sort of really just a bunch of these pairwise communications, but in a more convenient way. So if you're doing a global sum or you're doing a, an operation where you're sending a piece of data, you can do that collectively. And then there's a bunch of routines, and most of this is hidden under the hood for moving data in and out of memory. Because we're working in a distributed memory section, unlike um, your threading where you can just point to the memory here, you actually have to copy it out of, into a buffer, out of a buffer, back and forth. And so there's a lot of memory movement. And as we know, that's overhead and you don't want to do that. So they've got some under the hood things to try to make that as fast as possible. Okay. Um, so uh, messages have a sender and receiver. This is where the pairwise comes from. You always, we call this active sending and receiving. Okay, so this is just to get some terminology on. When you're sending a message, you don't need to specify the sender. Um, so if I'm sending, I'm saying hello. I don't say hello. I don't have to say hello on processor one. I, that, that's implicit. It knows it gets that piece of information from it. But on the receiver, it has to know where he's getting it from because it could be multiple messages and has to know where to route it and this type of thing. Um, and so it has to be actively see, received by the process. So when you send a message, you're, you're, there's some basic pieces of information you have to tell it. You have to tell it what, what it is. Am I a double? Am I a float? Am I a list of them? And usually it's an array, and I know the length of that array. So if I want to say send 10 floats to you, I ha as part of that message, I have to kind of give it some information. I have to say, okay, I'm going to send a message to processor 3 from me um, with uh, an array of 10 doubles. Okay. So I have to, so it has, cause it needs that information to create memory storage and all this other type of stuff. This is where the nuance gets. There's a lot of this sort of bookkeeping that you may not be used to doing, especially in a higher level language. Here you don't have a choice. You kind of have to get into um, keeping track of that stuff. We give up on passing by reference? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, you can pass into the function by reference, but then it's going to copy it for you. Right, because it's uh, there is no you can't reference memory that you don't have access. It may actually do that. It will create the buffer and this sort of stuff. But you may actually have to create your own buffer on the receiving end if you don't want to overwrite your same data. So yeah, this is going to be a little more manual, um, old school buffering control. It's very if you're if you're into communication stuff, this is this is all like writing your own TCP/IP stack type stuff. Um, just hopefully not as ugly, but yeah, you are going to have to manage that. So um, MPI messages are a string length. Basically, just think of it as a vector. It could be of length one, and then it's just one single variable, or it could be 10 million. It's just a 1D array. And then there's some standard types. Um, this get, some people get a little annoyed that they can't just pass in their their um, uh, you know their object from C++. Well, this is old school. It doesn't have that sort of construct. You can kind of make one and break an MPI type, but by default, it's just a bunch of arrays, a bunch of 1D, you know, doubles, floats, you know, strings, whatever you want. I mean, or characters. So you kind of have to just track that. So the types exist for characters, integers, floats, um, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and there's also a tag. This this tag is really just kind of a, exactly what it's called. A tag is just a flag. Usually it's just some integer value um, that you can just know which messages are. Because you have multiple messages going on, you want to know is that message 6 or message 10. Sometimes for what we're doing, for these examples, you don't really need to worry about it. But it does have that reference so that you can kind of know that, oh, is this message 6 or message 8, that type of thing. So that's something, that's a mechanism you can come up with just to track what's going on with the messages. Once again, you could have multiple Depending on your communications pattern, this could be quite confusing. Okay, so that's sort of the general idea of what goes into a message. 
Um, I, I'm, I'm, I know I'm breezing through this fast, but the examples will do a better job of showing this than me getting up here and just talking about syntax all the time. So um, the size of the MPI library, people get daunting. They start looking at the documentation. They see piles and piles of S sends, R sends, B sends, I sends. There's a lot of it because there's a lot of fun. Because once again, they're just a pile of functions. But most of it is duplication. Um, there's well over 200 functions. I think there's over 300 now. And some of them are really long, and they, there's a syntax to what it means. But a lot of them are duplications because it's the same type of a receiving, but it depends on how you want to receive that message. Um, but effectively, it's just a send and receive. There might be 12 different versions of that one. It's kind of like having a, you know, a double, a float, uh, you know, a character version of everything. Um, this, they're all explicitly spelled out here, and you have to use the right one. Um, and we'll talk about the differences in some of that later, but that's why it can be a bit daunting. The important part is um, we're going to use 10 and 12. Actually, we're going to use probably 8 at the beginning. And 10 is all you're probably, those functions are all you're really going to have to use for any sort of typical code that you're going to write uh, and the examples that we go through here. Okay, so let's look at a, uh, you know, our, our perfunctory hello world example. Um, actually, the text is not too bad on there, even though with the white background. So here's a basic example of a very bare minimum that we need an MPI code. Okay, so this is just a C example. So int main, typical stuff. You're always usually going to have two pieces of information in an MPI code. And they're usually referred to as the rank and size. Rank is my ID. So at the very minimum, I'm going to have zero to be, uh, I started zero in this case. It, it's all, even if you're in Fortran, it's still zero. So we'll talk in C because then at least it's consistent. Um, so processor zero is always going to exist. You may not have one, two, three, or four, but you always have zero because there's going to be at least one. Okay, so that's my rank. Size means how many are in are, are operating together, and you have to set that in MPI, kind of like setting the number of threads. You set a runtime. So if I'm going to be running on a processor with eight, a node with eight um, cores, then I'll set MPI run eight, and then that my size would be eight, and my rank could be zero to seven. Okay. So the rank is just my ID, size is how many are in the field. And that's important because we have to know how many messages to create, you know, where we're, what, we're going to do some math based on that size to know how to divide up our work. And I actually have to know who I am um, to make sure that I can collect information and this sort of type of thing. So you're always going to have that piece of information. So if we, we, we always going to start with this sort of, this is going to be a cut and paste in pretty much every one of your codes. So int, rank, and size. So then I say, I, init, I have to initialize. It's a library. I don't have it by default. Everything before this is just going to be run serially. Okay. Once I go MPI init, then I can start, that'll start the library up and do the initialization stuff. You don't have to worry about what's there. Just basically it starts up the library and does all the communications and it's hidden from you for the most part. Then I can start making MPI calls. So one of the first things I'm going to do is I want to know my rank. I want to get that piece of information. So here I've initialized it, but I don't know what rank I am. I'm running this thing in MPI is it runs this code exactly on every process it starts. So it, initially they, they all look exactly the same. So then I'm, this com rank goes to the, the MPI library and says, okay, who am I? And so then it loads in my rank. So the com world just means of everybody, everybody. We're primarily going to use different communicators, but, or this is, a world communicator, and we'll talk about that later, but basically this means everybody in the world. It means everybody we've started with. So if we started with eight, our world exists of eight. So I get my rank, which could be zero to seven, and then I get my size, which is just a, you know, how many are there, right? So now I have that piece of information. I can output it, and then I can, then at the very end, when I'm done, all the MPI I'm done, I have to hit finalize. And this is just like clean, cleaning up memory and this type of thing, okay? So those are the sort of the main pieces, and this is going to be the cut and paste you're going to have in every every case. Okay. Now this is a real; it doesn't do much, <laughs> but it does um, at least start the MPI library. Okay. So, so that's that's our Hello World example. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, um, there's a couple of different. Uh, ways to compile it, but the easiest and the most straightforward were is to use their wrappers, okay? So you, you're always going to have something like MPI CC or MPI C++. You just replace your RIC typical compiler with this wrapper script, 
and then just compile it like you would anything else. And you see your Fortran code. So if you Fortran, use all your Fortran flags, all your library flags. You just treat this compiler, just use a different name of the compiler. And that's much easier. So well, let's, let's, um, uh, let's see if I can pull that up here. So I have that in a repository. Um, did I put it up CD scratch? Oops. Unfortunately, the screen is not working. I have to um, CD MPI. Yeah, I already, I already have it here. Okay, so, so to load MPI, um, let, me, let me pull that up. Can you guys see that? Stop where it's on black. Um, Okay, so you need a compiler. So in this case, I'm going to use GCC, just like you did for the other cases. And then you need an open MPI built with your specific compiler. Okay, so it, when we've taken this, and we've usually built this for our, the GPC in this station with a particular compiler. So usually you're going to have something that looks like this. So I'm just going to source setup module list. So I've got those variable. Now if I go MPI, which MPI C++. Okay. Now if I go, say if I go GCC, um, -V, it shows me that. If I go MPI C++, I actually see it looks just like MPI. The difference is, is it's been compiled with some other pieces thrown in. Okay. So... Now I'm going to compile, if we look at, um, so this is my Hello World. Is this Hello World? Maybe it's a different version of Hello World. Oh, that's Hello World Send. Oh, that's a little different. Maybe I didn't have the regular one there. <coughs> oh, and I called it something different. Um, ah, there we go. So, same idea, that's what we had in the code there. Rank, size, init. We're going to get our, our who we are, and then we're going to put it to the screen. So I can go MPIC, MPIC, plus, plus, dash, oh, MPI, MPI, hello world, that's CC. And it compiles, just like you would any other code. code. And then, now I can just go like this. Oh, it complains because it says, it complains because I didn't put the past stuff, but it actually did work. It says, hello from task zero, one world. Um, basically saying, okay, I ran serially, right? But the whole point of MPI is not to run serially. So normally what we do is we go MPI run, and then the bare minimum, this is a wrapper script again that sets up all the MPI flags you're going to want to run. Um, and the very bare minimum is I need number of processors. So I can do eight. And then just give whatever I would normally run. Oops. Okay. So now it did run eight copies all at the same time. And uh, you can see it output size, of course, is going to always be eight in this case. And then the rank is zero, one, two, three, four. And you can see it comes out at different times because. There's no real synchronization. At, in, in this code, we just said run, right? It, it, the MPI init will be synchronized and the finalized be synchronized, but in the middle, it'll just come out wherever it does, and the operating system is just going to throw that out. So that's one thing to be, be sure. People don't trust the output here, especially unless you've sorted it, because you might think it's coming from processor 1, and it might be coming from processor 2. You're going to get this in any order, right? Kind of like in the threading example, you're doing the same sort of thing. It's because if I do this again, I might come up with a different pattern. And it's not wrong. It's just, see, now 7 is at the top, right? So you, just, you have to be aware of that because people like to use this for debugging and get confused because each time you run it, it's not, there's no guarantee. Um, but this will work on any. So 4. And the nice thing about MPI, too, is um, especially something simple like this, you can easily overload the number of processors and it'll work fine, too. Right? So if you're, you're like, oh, I don't want to do MPI programming on my laptop. I only have two cores. Well, you can. 
right? You can test it. You can test it up to more. Of course, now you're over committing it a bit, and so you don't want anything that's heavy performance to do that. But an example like this, that's perfectly fine, right? Of course, you don't want to do that for timing examples, but it, it, it does support that. Okay. So that's the general ecosystem around MPI. Um, okay. Is there any quick questions for that? Just sort of. We'll get into the, I just wanted, I know I breezed through some of the context of the syntax and stuff. We'll get into that. But I just wanted to show you sort of the quick example of what's in an MPI code. There's a library. You load the library. There's a couple of function calls you have to make. You always don't want to know your rank size because that's going to tell you how you're going to do everything with those two numbers. That's what you're going to determine what I'm going to do with each other. So that's very, very different than what you're doing with a threading example where you never cared about which thread you were on. You just said, here's eight threads. You go figure it out. In this case, you have to figure it out. You have to do the, the legwork on this one and, and, and figure out who's going to where. So that's, that's, there is, as I said, there's more bookkeeping here. And that's actually what most of MPI actually is, is bookkeeping. bookkeeping. OK. So let's, let's talk about what MPI Run does. So this was our Hello World. And then if we were running on multiple nodes, here we were just running on one node. So it's easy. It just launches them all. If you opened up top, you'd see all of them running. But MPI has the construct in it to do to actually go and log in to all those other nodes as well. So under the hood, um, in our system, from, the, from you submit a job to the queue, it actually gets the list of all the nodes and then knows how to log into each of those and launch those jobs. So you can think, think of it just as a launcher, OK? And you can actually launch, um, you can use MPI run to launch non-jobs, uh, uh, non-MPI jobs as well. You do MPI run dash NP4 LS, and it'll just make it, uh, run four copies of that. We hide most of this from the GPC, but if you do MPI run dash H, you see lots of uh, some people are used to you are used to saying dash dash machine file. If you run this on your own setup, you'll have to see that type of details. But there's a lot of other ways you can tell it. You only say you wanted to run a lot of memory. You can tell it to only put one task, or you're running hybrid. You may only want you want to want to control the number of tasks per each pro, pro, uh, machine, and you do that through MPI Run as well. So number of processors. This is the one that you're going to flag. It's usually dash n or dash np, and this is this is your equivalent to your o, OMP num threads. This is where you're going to determine this. Um, number of processors is almost always equal to the number of processors. That's usually a good place to start because if you have an efficient code that's, that's using the processors properly, then that's as good as you can you, you want. So in our system in the GPC there'd be eight. You could go up to sixteen, but normally uh, it's better to fix to start with the number that you're gonna that are number of physical cores. So we already did that trend we run with twenty four it does work because it just runs it's gonna run them eight at a time or eight it's gonna launch all of them but the processors are going to swap them in and out. Uh, it runs any program. You can run host name. That's useful too if you want to make sure that you're on the same node. Um, it doesn't really matter, or LS, anything else. Um, and it, it's, once again, this is just more of the ecosystem of MPI run. Not directly part of, it's, it's, it's part of the implementation of MPI, not so much the MPI library itself. Okay, so we ran our Hello World example, and we get this list. Um, this is a useful flag for open MPI. I will warn you, MPI is a standard. The MPI, MPI implementations aren't. So when you run MPI run or MPI CC, the compilers, sometimes the flags will actually, a lot of the flags are very different, whether you're using open MPI or um, uh, MPitch based ones. You know, dash um, NP is the same pretty much in all of them, but a lot of the other ones are different. It's kind of like compiler flags. The C, in C++ are, are compiled, but the flags can be very different. So just, just be warning if you're like, well, this used to work, and then you've ch switched to MPIs. Some of the flags, not the code itself, but some of the flags might have to change. So here's a useful one in open MPI. If you tag output, it'll automatically put um, the, 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 the ID of the, the actual task and which rank it is um, in front of every output that you do. So you don't have to actually put in your code, you know, see out, uh, you know, rank and size each time. It'll actually do that for you. So this can be kind of a quick way to do some, you know, low and dirty debugging again. So one in this case is, this is the ID. Um, I don't know. I don't know why it does that. 
No, I don't think so. Well, let's try it. Let's, let's, um, it might be the node number. I can't remember if it tracks that. Yes, yeah, so it's just... Yeah, I have to look. I'm not sure, actually. It's a good point. It, the important part is the second number. <laughs> but it, it actually might it might actually be the hosts. Um, we'd have we could double check that, but it, it may it, it it wouldn't surprise me if it knows that if all the host names. So it's one, two, three, four, because you know, could be on multiple nodes. You, know, you try it out, but I normally don't. I normally only use it on a single node for debugging. It's not. It, you could try it out. But that doesn't exist in the Intel MPI, so you know, hey guys, read. Okay, so back to our Hello World example. Uh, we're going to now talk a little bit more about a little more in detail about we we I mentioned these constructs, but I didn't really understand what what's a com, what's a communicator, what do these things mean um, in the context of the MPI sort of vernacular. Okay, so let's go through the basic components. The include MPI.h or MPI f.h. Um, yeah, sorry. Which tags? Oh, oh. Um, I think this just tags. The, it only uh, you could redirect the output to a file, right? Because all this is doing is tagging standard out, right? Okay, so you can See. Tag anything. Yeah, yeah, anything. You, this is this is just this example. It's just automatically all it's doing is anything that comes from the code. It's just sticking a header in front of it. So that's why it's saying standard. You can look in the if you really want to detail the options, go to the Open MPI, and there, I'm sure there are other options for putting into a file, sorting it. It's just there's, a, there's honestly there's a lot of options. So you know how you want to use it is up to you. Um, okay, so back to uh, let's go back to yeah. So we need a header file include the library. Init is really just like you know main. You're just going to start with that. You you can some people agonize on where how far up the code should this go before I initialize my main program that type of thing the point is is just if you're going to do any calculations in parallel you need to have that started first um, you're going to do this once and then you're going to finalize at the end okay and then I error is just your error codes it has some bookkeeping where you can status you know did it was this successful that type of thing so you can track that typical sort of um, programming lagging that's the easy stuff because you just it's going to be in every code the communicators are what well, we're going to talk about now specifically about what's in MPI. So a communicator is a way or a construct in MPI that is a group of like processes that you want to talk to each other. So the very, the very basic communicator that you always have is COM world. So when I launch uh, a process with eight tasks, where I, my, my world consists of those eight available tasks to talk to. Um, so I, I always have that. So this is the rank inside this world communicator, and this is the size inside that, or the total size of that. So almost everything we're going to do is going to be just with COM world, because I don't want to make a subdivision, but you could. So communicator is a group of processes. So in this case, we've got four tasks. COM world, in this case, if I launch with MPI run dash NP4, has four components, the circles being our representative tasks, and our ranks are 0 to 3. Okay? So MPI, this is, a, the, 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 this is a, its, its grouping of tasks. So each task has a rank from 0 to size, and every task in your program belongs to this COM world. Okay? So you always have that. So you're always safe to use COM world. But you're like, I'm a picky guy. I want to make my own communicator. MPI says, sure. If you want to work with subdivisions and I want to make, this is my calm world of everybody in the class, but I want these guys to do something. But I, so I want to break up a communication and only do on this one, and I want to make another communication and only work on this half. And I can do that. So from another communicator, my calm world, I could create up, I could create a new communicator that uh, kicks out Ramses because we don't like to tell him secrets. Right? So we, we can make a communicator that excludes him. Um, because you know we don't want we don't we don't we're only going to be working on part of the problem, okay? So we can do that. It it gives us all this type of things, and then all our functions will work on these communicators, okay? 
So we can create those subgroups because there's some programming mechanisms where maybe you want that. You don't, if you're doing collective operations on a thousand processors and you only really need 10, it doesn't make sense to do, to communicate to all thousand when you only need to work on those 10. Now maybe you need to do that and that's why you use Calm World. And admittedly, I primarily almost always use Calm World, but there are times where it may make sense to break up your own communicator. Okay, so at least having an understanding, even if you're not going to use them, that's why you'll see that why we always have to, it doesn't just take, they say, why do I have to bother including the communicator on all these comm operations? Well, it's because you could be talking to a different group of people. Okay? So, yeah? So before you're, you're, I think you're kind of passing the size, encryption typing, and, yeah. and the number. So how would you do it? How do you have to pass, I, I imagine like the rank for the comm word, and, and also the size, the size sorry, for this new, well, when you create a communicator, you're going to start with another communicator. So you start with Com World, and then inside that, you'll inside your program, not on the terminal, you'll you'll say, oh, take half them, or maybe it's a fixed size. You, there's another command function that creates that communicator. So there's a new. So every every new communicator will come from Com World, right? Because you're going to create a subgrouping. But you so so you, you effectively you create Com World on the command line, and everything else is commanded internal to the program. Now you can control that any way you want, but that's that's up to you. So Com World is our global communicator, um, and this that's our Com rank is operating. All it really says, give me a communicator, I'll give you my, your rank, and give me and, and on that communi communicator, give me the size. Okay. Um, and rank and size are as I mentioned before, these are the things. And that's why I keep using the term rank and size, rank and size, and it's good to stick with those terminology because that's what everybody uses. Um, you don't have to. You can call them whatever you want, but it, I would recommend calling them rank and size. Um, you, this is where you're doing the bookkeeping from. And uh, as I said, the compiler assigns the jobs and the threads for OpenMP, but in this one, you actually, the MPI run does, and then you have to control, am I processor zero? Maybe I should write the IO. Am I sending it to one? Am I sending it to three? Who's on my left? Who's on my right? You know, which, which piece of data is going where? And so this is, this is the puzzle, you know, to figure out. Uh, and you don't actually have to, you're just tracking it by a rank and size. The imp, the, it'll figure out where on all of the 10 nodes that is. You don't really even care most of the time. But you do have to know the order if I'm going, I'm going to split my numbers from one to a thousand into four groups. I got to know who has zero to 250, who has 250 to, to uh, you know, 500, right? And so I have to track that. And now I'm going to do that by the rank and size, okay? Okay, so that's the introduction. Let's actually get into a little bit of um, actual message passing in the last few minutes here. <laughs> um, so the basic pairwise communication is a send and receive. Um, you're going to have a send, which is a operation that will take a piece of data and send it to one of our other friends in our world. Okay, and then we'll have the other end. As I said, we always have to actively send and receive messages. So every pairwise communication for every send, I'm going to have a receive. Okay, so at the top here, this is the general syntax that you're going to see for a send and receive. We have a send. We're going to have a pointer at the beginning to some function of memory that we say, yes, a buffer that we've created that we're going to load the data into. So before we call it, we're going to create a buffer. Or it could be, if I'm sending it, it could be just my existing memory, my array of whatever. Then count is how big that is. What, is, it a, is it an array of size 10? Is it an array of size 1,000? The MPI type, that's going to be your double, your float, your car, whatever that type array is. Then I'm going to give it a destination. This is going to be a rank of where I want it to go. I don't need to give my destination because it knows if I'm zero, I know where I'm sending it from then. Then the tag, that's just, as we talked about, that can be any non-negative value. That's just a way of doing bookkeeping. And then the communicator, okay? As I said, we could be working on different communicators. Most of the time, that's going to be MPI Calm World, okay? And then the receiver looks exactly the same, except for now we've got a receive pointer. This is going to be a pointer to where I'm going to copy data into. Usually that's a buffer, a temporary location, because I may not want to overwrite directly. I could, but it depends. I may not want to write, overwrite my existing data right away. So you just have to be careful with that. Count, it's going to have to match. So you're always going to basically program these in two pieces. We literally do both functions at the same time, one after the other. And then the source, 
means where it's coming from. Where's that message coming from? I know the receiver, of course, is me. So this, as I said, number of elements. Uh, this is the double float types. Destination is the uh, rank and send receiver. Um, unique ID and MPI com world. And then there's a status. This is a receiver status. You can do a little bit of bookkeeping on that one. Most of the time you don't have to worry about it, but it's like error codes and that sort of thing. So that's why on the receiver, you can have an MPI status to sort of query it and that type of thing. That'll make more important for other types of communications, but for basic send and receive, it doesn't matter. So let's, let's, how, how would we, let's, let's create a quick uh, message here and, and, and talk about how we would use this. How does this actually fit in? So we take that original hello world code, looks the same, MPI include the header file, I've got my rank and size, and then I've, I've added a few more, like message sent and message receive. I'm just going to call it tag one, pretty basic stuff. I have our boilerplate stuff, my init, my com, my com size. And then I'm going to create some messages. These can, in our case, they're just two variables. I'm going to set my message sent. I'm going to set it to 111. And now my message receive is a temporary location. So I'm going to just set it to a, to a number just so that I know when it gets overwritten. I don't have to, but I should. It's just a way of doing bookkeeping, okay? So I set that to receive. So those are just, as I said, just a single variable. Then here we're going to do, okay, I'm going to say uh, if rank equals zero. So if I'm processor zero, I'm going to send a message. So I want to send a piece of data from processor zero to processor one. Say we're only going to work with two. Very basic. So I'm going to say MPI send, message sent. I'm going to load. That's the reference to the, my, my sending message. It's only one, so it's simple enough. It's a double. Um, then we're just going to, our tag we put there, and then MPI com world. And it's going at the second, the one over here is where it's going, okay? Because I know I'm on zero, I want it to go to one. And then on the receiving side, I'm just going to have the flip side of that. I'm on rank one, I'm going to receive something. It's only one long, it's a double. I'm receiving it from zero. So now you can kind of see where some of the annoyance comes with MPI. There's a lot of bookkeeping. <laughs> you have to control all this crap yourself. <laughs> it's just it's a it's a pain, but that's that's in order to make it generic and, and it's not too bad. But yeah, you're going to spend some time. You know, am I zero? Am I one? Who's two? Who's you know? There's, you're going to scratch a lot of little doodling on the paper to figure out these patterns. Okay. And then we just gonna we just put output at the same time. Then we finalize, and we can return zero. Okay, so as I said, it's not, it's not super onerous, it's just there's bookkeeping to be done. Because now, you know, as I said, you're not going to re remember all this order <laughs> most of the time. And it matters, but you're going to, this is where you, you kind of try to minimize it as much as possible and just follow the previous, uh, you know, these examples or something or some uh, online examples because it, these can get long. Okay. Oh, sorry. So when the code is launched, it automatically runs two versions of everything, right? It's going to, when you launch MPI run, it's going to automatically, so here, this code is going to be run twice. It's going to be, so, so when you go MPI run dash NP2, you're going to run two copies of it. So, for most of the code, it's just running two serial codes in this code. I'm, you know, I'm, I've got one hand here running, and we're going line by line, doing bang, 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 bang. And we're doing exactly the same thing until we start doing some operations with rank, right? So now, if I'm on processor zero over here, it jumps into this loop and does this part, right? The other guy skips this and then jumps into this loop. And it waits here until it gets that message. Okay? That's, we're doing blocking message passing. And that, that's important because that'll change how, we, how the code flows. So it, it's the simplest to start from because literally it'll, this one has to go first and then this guy will wait until he gets that piece of information. This one goes right away and he goes and he goes and he waits right here because it's not doing this, right? But that's why you think the code in parallel, they automatically are parallel. As soon as you just run the two, the two codes, the same code is being run on both processors. It's just the, a little bit of logic that you put in is what's making it parallel. 
Okay, two full tasks, two full copies of everything. So if you don't do anything, you just get two serial codes and two copies of the exact same thing. Right? If you put in the logic and you put in the message passing to, 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 to disrupt that and say, okay, you work on 0 to 250, you work on 250 to, to 500, that's when they'll do different workloads. But that's, that's, it. that's an important part that a lot of people get, are like, how is this parallel? Well, because it, it, you're really just running two serial codes with some hooks to, to do the parallel work for you. Okay, um, I think I'm pretty much, let's just, we're going to do first message and then I'll, I'll end because we're at noon. Um, so I'm going to do make because I'm lazy. I don't want to, I've just got this all built here. Um, What I get for picking GPC01. There we go. So I was just building all these. Um, all these examples are there too. So that was a Git repo. If you go pull these slides up, you can pull those into your own account. So I said, highly suggest you do that, especially if you start starting. Just use this framework. So, so if we look at first message, oops, not the. You guys can read that, right? Um, anyway, so this is just the example that we just put up there, just so I'm not lying to you. Now let's go MPI. I could type. Slash MP. Let's go to dot slash first message. Bang. Um, so nothing too fancy about that. Send 111 from 0, receive 111 from 1. So all we did is on 0, it sent a piece of data, and it runs right away. This one waits in that receive and then puts it out. What do you think will happen if I put it um, MP4? Is anything going to be any different? You think? Nope. So what's going on? Why don't I see four messages? Because of this if statement, right? The only guy who's going to send the message is zero. And the only guy I receive is one. So if I have four running, zero and one are doing something, two and three, skip this whole thing and do nothing, right? So it's safe, wasteful, <laughs> but it doesn't do anything, but it works, right? And this is, this is, this is going to be a common theme that you, when you're MPI programming, is you have to be careful that you don't get we're going to talk about deadlocks and this type of stuff too, where you get in a case where it only works if you go in this loop, and then none of the other guys sit there around waiting, and that's a common problem you're going to run into. Excuse yeah. Uh, MP lambda. Odd number? You can only work with evens. What do you think? Yep. Not three and a half. <laughs> no, any integer, it's fine. Commonly, we work with even numbers because it makes the things work out two, four, six, eight, you know, powers of two type of thing because it works on our node numbers. But yeah, no, there's no rule. So you can, you can do, you just can't do zero. <laughs> you can do one to n. It's fine. Um, that's important though because sometimes you might have, when you've programmed it, you may have always done divide by an even number and you don't think of, oh, if there's an odd number, you have to be shifted by one. So you have to do some logic there because maybe you only divide, say you had 100 and you divided by three. Uh, that doesn't go well, right? I've got 33, 33, 33, and one. So then you have to put in some logic that says 33, 33, and 34. Right? But yeah, that's that. But you can. There's there's nothing to stop you from doing that. Okay, I'm going to stop there, um, and uh, we'll we'll start up right here uh, on the next class. Okay. So yeah, you, if you don't have your GPC stuff or you haven't logged in, I would go in, go uh, up to that. I think right in the front. Uh, and here I actually had the instructions. Do this. And even read ahead and look at the other examples if you want. Um, just, just, just to even just try to understand some of this stuff, some of the syntax and stuff, because it is one of those ones where you're going to have to play around with a little bit to understand it. Okay, so I highly recommend that.